Scientific Society of India, POSI. Uh, I'm Alaric Arujas, and I'm the Vice President of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. And today we have two very eminent speakers who are going to share their experience and their expertise on a topic which is dear to all of us, and that is developmental dysplasia of the hip. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of issues and controversies regarding the diagnosis and management of this condition. And it's something that we as pediatric orthopedic surgeons and even some general orthopedists who deal with it on uh, an occasional basis. And because the topic is so vast, we have decided to restrict ourselves to just the uh, age group from birth up to three years of age. So we will not be discussing about the older patients, nor will we be going into the management of adolescent and adult hip dysplasia. Uh, to introduce our two speakers, uh, we have two very eminent hip surgeons with us today. Uh, the first, of course, is our good friend, Dr. Kishore Mulpuri. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of British Columbia and an attending surgeon at the BC Children's Hospital at Vancouver, Canada. He is the director of the International Hip Dysplasia Registry and a very close friend of POSI. Uh, he's been to several of our meetings. He has mentored a lot of us. Um, he is extremely high on collaborative work, not only with us in India, but with several centers from around the world. And he's one of the foremost experts when it comes to DDH. So we're really glad to have him on board today. Welcome, Kishore. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Woodbub Shankar. Woodbub is an associate professor at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, US. Uh, he is also an attending uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And his interests uh, are across the entire range of pediatric hip conditions, right from DDH to Perthes, to slip capital epiphysis, to FAI, and management of uh, adult hip dysplasia as well. So what we'll do today is to have uh, two talks, the first by Kishore Mulpuri on the early screening and management of, of DDH, and then Woodbub will take us through the little older child up to the age of three. After this, we have a very interesting interactive case discussion session, and I know a lot of questions will come out at that time. So I would suggest that all of you who have questions in the audience should hold on, note your questions down. You can certainly ask them during the talks, but they will all be answered towards the end during the interactive discussion session. And at that time, we'll bring on board our panelists as well. And I would introduce our, our two panelists today, Dr. Ramni Narsimhan, who's the uh, past president of POSI, and Dr. Vijay Sriram from Chennai, who is a, uh, uh, another hip surgeon and has a lot of expertise when it comes to DDH. On our panel today, we also have Dr. Dhiran Ganjwala, who's the president of POSI, to share his experience and expertise as well, and Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, who is the secretary of POSI. So without much ado, I will hand over the mic to Kishore, Kishore, you can start sharing your screen and take us through that initial presentation of DDH and what we need to know in that young child who comes to us with DDH up to the age of six months. Can you see my eye screen? Uh, okay. Not yet. We can see the screen. Dr. Kishore wants to share the screen. Yes. Ah, hey, we can see a screen. Don't minimize it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's good. Let's start the slideshow. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Yes. It's very clear. You can go ahead. Great. Good morning, everyone. And uh, as Al talked about, I have a long association with, uh, with POSI and I was there at the first meeting of POSI in 19, I guess at the pre-first meeting, which happened in Vancouver and then followed by the meeting in Mumbai. So it's a real privilege uh, to be here and uh, attending POSI meeting is one, of, I would say one of the highlights of my 
academic travels and social travels, dare I say, because I've got quite a few friends and catching up with them. And as far as I can, and when this thing slows down and count me in and Goa and any other meeting that's going to come in the next few years, and I'll be there. It's also a real pleasure. Um, the panelists are uh, close friends and uh, also indeed an honor, actually, to be presenting with Woody Shankar. Woody has been a very active member in the pediatric hip circles and uh, is a, one of the co-directors of International Dysplasia Institute, which is the body that really started all of this moment of trying to work collaboratively together for a prospective study. Now on the executive of International Dysplasia Registry, and you would see throughout my presentation, several papers have his name attached to them. So it's a real honor actually to be co-presenting with him. So without further ado, I will uh, go into the topic. So these are some of the mentors that have heavily influenced who I am today. And you will also see as much, uh, I try to present first what I do and try to give some evidence background and sort of my preferred technique, but who I am today and what I do for my clinical practice, where there is not a strong evidence, where there's ambiguity or where the art of orthopedics, which we all do differently from the science, is heavily in influenced by these mentors from different parts of the world who I've had a great pleasure of working very closely with over the years. And as far as DDH is concerned, most notably, Dr. Chad Price, who actually started the IHDI, and I owe a lot of gratitude to him. And I'd also like to acknowledge the funding for most of our hips that comes from this organization called I'm a Hippie. So in my talk, I'd briefly like to outline about terminology and the spectrum of DDH that we see, screening and diagnosis of development dysplasia of the hip in 2020, what should we be doing around the world and in India? And I will talk about brace management and after that, Dr. Shankar will talk about the close reduction and the treatment and management of the older child. So I'm not going to go into the definition of DDH with you all, which you all know it's a spectrum of dysplasia of the hip. And it, the variable incidence, depending on what you're looking at, and also the incidence in terms of subluxations and dislocations are different based on what kind of screening practices we use. And that's why there's wide variability in terms of subluxations and dysplasia that's reported around the world. Places that have universal ultrasound screening program obviously diagnose way more. I'd like to introduce this uh, spectrum to you if you're not familiar with it. The reason that we started using this in IHDI, now IHDR studies, is that our literature is filled with terms like otolani positive, bottle positive, uh, dysplasia of the hip, not really specifying the spectrum that we're dealing with. Are we dealing with a dislocated reducible hip? Are we just dealing with just a mild dysplasia? When you call bilateral DDH, are you talking about two mild dysplastic hips? Are you talking about one side a mild dysplasia, another side a dislocated reducible hip? Because the management and outcomes are very different. So it's really important when you're trying to publish, when you're trying to communicate with someone, when you're presenting a paper, when you're looking at your own outcomes, really have to think about where in this spectrum that particular hip belongs, if it's unilateral or bilateral. And moving on to screening, and as some of you will identify when you get hips that are three, four, five years of age, because in India, we don't even have a universal clinical screening. If we have a good universal clinical screening, clinical screening that happens at well baby checks, we won't be dealing with the number of hips that we deal with. And so we probably don't have any kind of an organized screening method. There are some countries where clinical screening is a must. Every single child is screened and documented in the chart that this child is screened for hip dysplasia. And in some countries where there is a universal ultrasound screening, which is very, very expensive, a lot of false positive, and some, I've not mentioned that here, I have actually 
a universal x-ray screening program. For example, in Chile, every single child needs to have an x-ray by the time they're between six months to a year of age. And there are a lot of other countries, including ours in Canada and our own province, we do high-risk screening. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail how to examine a baby hip, which you're all very familiar with, and that's, I think, taught really well to us for orthopedic surgeons in India. And the Bartlow and Ortolani maneuvers, again, the same thing that uh, quite routinely used for people that know how to do these tests. Moving on to ultrasound exam, there are two methods that frequently used. One is a hard key method, which is out of Wilmington, Delaware. And that really is a dynamic hip exam. And it's difficult to reproduce in terms of what is the quantity and quality of the pressure that you use to have that hip go in and out. So it is quite popular in some centers around the world, but universally, the ultrasound measures that we use are popularized by graph from Austria which typically takes into account your alpha angle, your beta angle, and your percentage from head coverage. And we start to think about if we see less than 50% from head coverage, and we start to worry about where the hip is at, but not frankly dislocated, but you start thinking about it. And I'll come to graph classification in a second. So if you look at this very complex uh, diagram or a table, the graph one is virtually a normal hip, and a graph two A and two B is mildly dysplastic. You have an alpha angle between 50 to 59. There is actually a measurement error of about five to eight degrees, depending on who measures that ultrasound. So there are some that would treat these two A's and two B's. And as you move on from two B and two C and into type D, and into three and four, you're moving on to the more severe end of the spectrum of the dysplasia of the hip. Personally for me, again, this is another picture that can show you about the type one and two, what they look like, probably in a schematic picture. And as you can clearly see in the three and the four, three where the labrum is pressed upwards and four where the labrum is pressed downwards are the ones personally that I would treat. And I will not treat a 2A and 2B personally. And uh, that's just my preference, but I do understand and accept there are a lot of surgeons that treat them around the world. And that is actually one of the topic of investigations as a part of a registry. When do we do ultrasound? If you're looking for dislocation, do an ultrasound whenever you want. But if you're really looking for dysplasia, that means your clinical exam, you're pretty sure the hip is in but you're not so sure based on the family history or some of the features, you really wanna understand what the hip looks like. And then you should really do that ultrasound between six to eight weeks of age. This study done out of Adelaide, Australia during the time I was a fellow by my co-fellow from Sweden, took the normal hip exams, no risk factor babies, and did ultrasounds at two weeks, and at four weeks and at six weeks. And they saw a trend towards a normalization of the hip roughly between four to six weeks. So really that's the time you wanna to wait to look for dysplasia. Anything before that, you end up getting a lot of false positive, hence the universal screening programs where they do ultrasounds between two and four weeks, treating a lot of those hips. When we looked at the systematic review of reproducibility of some of these metrics, it's really all over the map. There's a huge range and variability between what's considered normal and what's considered abnormal. But then there is also a measurement error between different studies. Uh, as you can see, there's a huge wide variability of inter and intra exam reliability. So even though we use these metrics now, we do need some better ways to quantify dysplasia as we move forward. And this study done by International Dysplasia Institute, led by Woody Shankar, really looked at what is the correlation of a fully dislocated hip with alpha angle, beta angle, and percentage from head coverage. They found 
if you take a cutoff about between 30 to 35 percent, you would end up probably covering 90 percent of the hips. And you might be wondering, why do we have 50 percent femoral edge coverage on ultrasound? And they thought the hip was frankly dislocated. And I will give you some examples of that. So here is an example of a child that's referred to us, had um, an ultrasound done, and it showed roughly about 40 percent femoral edge coverage. Looks not that bad on ultrasound. And you see, this is pretty close to two months and 28 days, almost three months. An x-ray done at three months, exactly to the day, two days later, we thought, look, that, that hip felt really funny. So we need to, you know, we got this patient to come back and did an x-ray. And you can see the hips look way different. I mean, that ultrasound, you must have thought, okay, I'll, I'll get them back in a week or two and see how they look. But this x-ray is not leaving your clinic without you coming up with a definitive plan. So there are issues in terms of false positive and false negative rate with some of these metrics. And what that study tried to do was try and quantify where can you get the 95, 90% predictive value and roughly around 35. So we're also working on a three-dimensional ultrasound, much like what they do in obstetrics, that's, they do actually do 4D ultrasounds. And as you can see in our preliminary research investigation, the variability when you use a 3D ultrasound is quite low. But this technique is not widely used, it's not widely popular, still a subject of investigation. Why do we need x-rays and when do we transition to x-rays? So personally for me, I'm able to transition to x-rays a little early between four to six months. And the earliest I've done in some of them to correlate if I thought that all sound looked really funny, even as young as three months. And we were able to do that because before, if you looked at it, most of our classification is based on tonus classification, which required your ospic nucleus to be appeared before you can use and figure out where that femoral uh, head is and what kind of dysplasia it is. And so that's how Ton is described as grades, grade one, two, three, four, pretty self-explanatory looking at these pictures as to what would be a grade one. But as you can see here, you do need the ospic nucleus to apply. And uh, again, IHDI came up with this classification because they had some centers that were doing x-rays really early to months, two and a half months, three months. And one of the criteria for entering a patient into the IHDI is pre-treatment, you should have had some imaging, whether it's a plain X-ray or an ultrasound. And even though I'm an author, I can't take credit for actually coming up with this classification. I helped with the manuscript. And they came up with this classification where you could look at this midpoint of basically the metaphysis and try and look at where the, and guess where the femoral head might be by grading it into one, two, three, four, based on which quadrant it's going to be. As you can see, clearly the three and the four are dislocated hips, and one would argue the two is a subluxable hip or subluxated hip. This, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but I would tell you, this is the kind of correlation we need before we give a final diagnosis. And that is one of the highlights of uh, Woody's paper. You all always have to correlate your clinical finding with your radiological finding and come up and grade what that hip is. And that's what we do in the database. So you're looking at where their femoral head is, their joint laxity, and where x-ray is available, their IHDI grade. You're looking at their acetabular morphology, and then you're coming up with a overall diagnosis which takes into account clinical and radiological, whether it is an x-ray or an ultrasound. Really, if you want to compare results of each center, want to compare results of one surgeon to another, one technique to another, this is really the kind of detail we need in our publication so that we could really compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Here is an example of a child that had an ultrasound done done quite early. As I said, sometimes we can see hips that are quite immature. And this patient was seen because the family doctor thought that at birth, the hip was dislocated. And at exam, the doctor at the time thought that, okay, I would get an ultrasound done and decided to 
leave that hip because it does qualify in the mild dysplasia range. So decided to leave that. And this patient comes back at three weeks and the hip starts to look a little worse. And at five weeks, you can see the coverage is a lot less. And clinically too, now this hip is dislocated but reducible. And uh, the, hip, the patient was treated in a brace and the hip started to improve. And then you can see on this x-ray that even though the ultrasound looked as good as it looked there, and the beta angle is quite low, so you're thinking, well, the hip is probably gonna develop quite nicely. Or this was a normal patient with risk factors, but if ultrasound always looked good, you do follow up with another x-ray because of this. You can see this x-ray roughly at six months of age, showing a dysplastic hip on your plain x-ray on the left side. Whether to treat this or not is a controversial topic, but what follow-up is required is also a controversial topic. But personally for me, um, I may or may not treat this hip after talking to the family, but I would for sure follow this hip along with another radiograph at least four to six months later. And this is that child that was left without any treatment but followed, and you can see this hip went on to develop into a normal looking hip. And how do we look at these x-rays? Those of us that are not used to seeing ultrasounds. And one of the things that we got when Al led the survey for POSI of pediatric orthopedic surgeons in India, one of the most concerning thing that people had was they had access to ultrasound, but they were not very confident about the reports they got from the ultrasound. So people wanted a little more information about how they would interpret once the X-ray ultrasounds are done. And I would simply say, we're used to looking at plain X-rays. So just try to orient yourself and make those ultrasound vertical. So that gives you a kind of information about where the femoral head is, how much, the, how much is the coverage and what the cartilage of that acetabulum is looking like and what the side of your ileum is gonna look like. So I simply sometimes I tilt my head if I can't tilt the ultrasound image. Back in the day when they used to get films and I would tilt them up and look at them just like the way I look at plain radiographs. And what do we know in terms of screening? So I was fortunate to be involved with these guidelines development with Posner and with American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. There were 25 members from seven different societies uh, that were actually a part of this guideline development. But what came out was there's a huge evidence gaps in terms of some of the topics that we're gonna to discuss today. But in terms of the old risk factors that we knew about, uh, you have them as firstborn, female, breech, Caucasian, left hip. But the guidelines that came quite strongly in these recent guidelines are breech presentation, family history, and I'd like to draw upon this particular term of clinical instability, which means if you have a referral from one of your orthopedic colleagues or a pediatrician colleague that says, I was there at the delivery and I examined the child less than a week and I thought the SIP is unstable. So that correlated highly with a dysplastic hip down the road and the history of swaddling, which is tying those hips really tightly. And then going back to what does the evidence show about screening, including those guidelines to what's been done as a part of a Cochrane collaboration or a Cochrane review. Boston Group did a really nice decision analysis, but the conclusions of all of them are exactly the same, which is in our current day with healthcare resources that are strapped, and also, as we can see with these kind of measures of social distancing where we cannot be doing every single child, can't afford to do an ultrasound, it's probably most cost efficient to do a universal clinical exam with a selective ultrasound screening with the risk factors that I mentioned before. And that's what we do in BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. And that's what a lot of other centers do. And now, once you do this, Right. Typically, you do a six-week ultrasound if you thought you had one of those risk factors or you worried about it. And then you end up having a multiple different outcomes from that ultrasound. You could have a hip that's frankly dislocated, which I don't think there is any controversy. Most people would say what well, I would treat that. 
severe dysplasia, most people would agree that I would treat that. Those I was talking about, either graph 2C on, onwards. What do you do with mild dysplasia? This is where the most amount of controversy is. And what do you do with the bottle of positive hips? And personally for me, these two, I would just follow them up with another x-ray between four and six months of age. Why do we need to do that? And this retrospective study done from San Diego, they looked at all the breech babies and at ultrasound at six weeks, they found about roughly 27% of them had abnormal ultrasound. But to be honest, that's not replicated by our study in Vancouver, which is unpublished. Our numbers are a lot lower than 30%. And then out of the ones that turned out to be normal, they had again roughly another 30% of them that showed dysplasia. So that shows you that that six weeks ultrasound is not end all and be all. You do need to follow these hips that are referred to you for risk factors, or if you thought the hip was unstable to start with, but stabilized by six weeks, you do need for the follow-up. And here is an example of a child. You can see that's three months and 11 days. That hip looks pretty good. This hip was dislocated to start with and, uh, and was treated. But again, as you follow these x-rays, you can see this x-ray done around the same time shows the degree of dysplasia that you see, right? So it's important to follow these. What is my approach? And I must admit that what you see as 12 months and 24 months right now is part of a research investigation. I am not recommending that we follow this up, but for sure we follow them up to six months with an x-ray. If that x-ray is normal, I think at that point in time, it's dealer's choice, but I do follow them a bit longer. Who do I personally treat? As I said, I do not treat mild dysplasia. This is again, highly controversial. I'm not suggesting all of you not to treat bottle positive hips, but I do not treat those hips. If the hip is in, I have to push the hip to go out. Uh, why would I want to use the brutal force and say, look, I think that hip now needs to be treated. So I personally won't treat them. This is again a subjective investigation. We're writing a randomized control trial protocol to be able to study as a part of our registry. Dislocated hips that are reducible, reducible, there's no controversy, and we will discuss that in the next few minutes. So the typical treatment is brace, close reduction or hip spike or cast, and surgery, which Dr. Shankar is going to discuss. What kind of brace? Again, I would say dealer's choice, but my preference is a pelvic harness, which is readily available. There is also a controversy versus soft which is rigid brace, which I'll touch upon. There are some centers that would prefer a rigid brace to start with. Some would start with a soft brace, and if that fails, they go on to a rigid brace. So how do you treat a dislocated reducible hip? I would start typically by putting them in a pelvic harness, and I tell the families that uh, I would use this for 24 hours. Now that I have a point of care ultrasound, I do an ultrasound at that time to see if the hip is in or out. Even if the hip is out, I wouldn't worry about it. I send the patient home. We teach them how to check for femoral palsy. We also check for and see if we have x-ray available in the clinic, we would do a follow-up ultrasound when we see them in the clinic. Again, there are not all centers that do that, but where they're available, especially as if you're collecting them as a part of research, you do see what's going on with that hip. If the hip is stable, then I do change my follow-ups to once every two weeks, and we can let them come out for bathing purposes at that point in time. Six to eight weeks, I do an ultrasound, and if the ultrasound is normal, which is alpha angle is more than 60 degrees, and beta is less than 50, I typically discontinue the hardness at that point in time, and I do see them back at four months to get an x-ray. But if the hip is dysplastic, is in but dysplastic. I sometimes switch over to a Rhino Cruiser brace because it's easy to apply and easy to take out and a lot easier for families. So I do make a switch to the brace more for ease than I my belief that this is a better brace than a pelvic harness. And I would, as I said, typically get x-rays at four to six months page. If you look at again this prospective study from IHDI, what are the results? And the brace treatment is successful in 79%. But if you look at the results, there are some that talk about 90%, some it's as low as 65%. So it does depend on 
what paper you're reading, again, what degree of severity of dysplasia they're dealing with. And here's, we're only talking about dislocated but reducible hips. And the factors are associated with base failure, obviously severity of dislocation, age of treatment, the brace type, and the hip that's affected, the right hip is more resistant to treatment. Here's an example of a six month old that came with actually a dislocated hip. Mind you, these slides are not mine, my colleague, uh, Tony Coopers. So Tony decided to treat this child in a pelvic harness. And when he put this kid in a pelvic harness, he got an X-ray done and it showed the hip is actually reduced. And he continued to follow this child. And this is typically what I would do. And people say, what follow-up X-rays do you get once you have a patient that you're treating either for a brace or a closed reduction? I typically get one X-ray in brace and one out of the brace. I want to know if you take the brace out, is the hip still stable? Can it still stay in? That's my litmus test to know if I can get this brace to come out. The length of time I would leave somebody out of the brace. And at three of follow-up, you can see that hip is nicely developed. So some people treat brace as a first line of option, no matter at what age they see the child. It doesn't matter if they're at three months, four months, six months, they would treat a child. Here's an example of a dislocated irreducible hip. And uh, again, this is a patient of Tony Cooper's. He treated this child with a Rhino Cruiser brace. Apparently he was trying to do a randomized control trial, I'm kidding, but so this patient, he went with a Rhino Cruiser brace and this patient uh, reduced quite nicely and still there is some residual dysplasia and this patient is being followed up as we speak. And what do you do if the public fails? Personally for me, I will move on at that point in time to talking to parents about closed reduction slash open reduction. And again, controversy in terms of timing. I would typically do any time from two months on, I have an informed discussion in terms of at two months, doing only a closed reduction. If closed reduction fails, I'm gonna bring that child back in at four or five months for an open reduction. A lot of my colleagues would argue Treating a child at two months may be slightly more anesthesia risk in terms of brain development down the road. And they would rather wait till four months of age to do closed last open reduction all at the same point in time. I totally agree with their philosophy. And I talk to the patient family and decide about what they would like to do. But there are a lot of people, if a public fails, they move on to a rigid brace because they think this may work. And what evidence do we have? So there are some papers that are published in the past that mainly talked about a good success rate with that, but there is also a paper that talked about they might not have seen a huge benefit with using this brace. Again, all sorts of different braces was used. And there's a lot of, mind you, these are small series. Woody Shankar looked at it from CHOP, and he had two groups that went straight to closed reduction and another group that went to a ridge, more of a rigid brace after Pavlik failed. And he looked at the success rate in terms of normalization of the hip, the HDI grades. Mind you, these groups are pretty comparable at baseline in terms of all the characters in terms of brace time, uh, pelvic hardness time prior to this treatment decision. And this is an example that he shared with me, mind you, these slides are his slides that he generously shared with me, that shows that this is a failure of public at four weeks of age, and the patient was then initiated onto this l felt orthosis, and at the end of bracing, that hip looked pretty normal. And this is how the l felt brace looks like. They had a pretty good success rate. They had about 82% success rate with the brace, which is quite high, but mind you, I don't use this brace. My rigid brace that I, I switched on to in few cases is a Rhino Cruiser brace. I did not have a huge success with this approach, but there are people that have successfully shown that. The other controversial topic is why do we stop pelvic honor? Why can't we go on three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks? Because this pelvic honor's disease was described. A lot of the time when we describe to coin a word or a particular problem, I often joke with my residents and say, if I drink too much wine on the night before I wake up on the left side of the bed, I come up with a term because Kishore Mulpuri came up with it for a number of years, people will talk about that. So public honesty, see, why do we stop at two or three weeks? There is no hard evidence that things morphologically change 
irreversibly at this point in time. Again, our own smart Dr. Shankar tried to look at in their hips where patients were left in the brace and patients were followed up much longer. And he did not show a big changes that we talk about in those hips, but that again needs to be studied in a larger cohort of patients more prospectively. What do we do with dislocated reducible hips? Treatment is pretty similar to the reducible hip, but the success rate is lower. The chance of femoral nerve palsy is a little bit higher. Here is a paper that looked at what is the success rate for dislocated irreducible rate. Remember we talked about for reducible hips, it was roughly about 79%, but here the success rate is about 59%. Still, it's a sensible first line of management as opposed to what we think, oh, this is an irreducible hip, so I'm gonna leave it alone. I would urge you to consider start treatment. And if it fails, then it's dealer's choice. Do you want to go on to a more rigid brace or do you want to go on to close reduction at a later date? What about this complication femoral nerve palsy? Again, we looked at that as a part of uh, this prospective study. And we also compared with this paper that's published from Texas Scottish Rite. And our results showed that our rate is about 5.9% of the patients that were treated that are dislocated and reducible and irreducible hip, but disproportionately high number happened to be from irreducible hips. You can see 12% in the dislocated irreducible hips, right? So when you put a dislocated reducible hip, you need to watch out for that complication. And this is where I would say your treatment preference comes into what you do because we are a prospective multi-center study, everybody treated differently. When I see a femoral nerve palsy, I rarely put them back in a brace again. I bring them back about two weeks. I put them back in a brace. And if the femoral nerve palsy comes back again, I stop the brace. So in my practice, a large number of femoral nerve palsies have gone on to close reductions. But in some others, they continued on brace. They went with a different kind of a brace and they've had a better success rate. So basically what that tells you is it's quite variable. What do you do? if you do see femoral nerve palsy. But I would say the sensible thing to do would be to stop the brace. But this needs to be again looked at much more broadly with time to really look at predictors. And this slide is sort of my kind of algorithm. If you wanna go back and look at later on about how I would manage someone from treatment of an abnormal hip to when I would discharge them from care. And why? did I talk so much about my preference, my pre even though we've been running this study for six years, is this is what tells you, when we did this survey of pediatric orthopedic surgeons of North America, there's a huge amount of variability. And this is exactly what Dr. L. Ruges found when he surveyed Posey, you guys, about how you manage that displacement of the hip. The evidence summary of what we know prospectively so far is again in this, Australian Journal, Medical Journal, for you to review. But hopefully, this registry, which also has some centers from India, will give us some insights maybe in the next five to 10 years on some of these controversial topics. You can see here, we've got five centers from India that are contributing. And at presentation, we have huge variability between the two groups of what we're entering in the West to India, that not necessarily that the mean age in India is three years, there are some younger children that probably were not entered into the database because they didn't have a priori um, radiographs or ultrasound. But nonetheless, you all know that you see way more walking age dysplasia than we do in this part of the world. And Al is working on this collaboration with Posey and IAP is leading those efforts. And I commend him for taking that initiative and Posey for investing their time, for IAP to invest in their time. And our registry is going to support the process, much like this care pathway that was developed by the Stanford group. Hopefully, we'll be come up with some tools that uh, you can use. But there are a lot of resources in the International Dysplasia Institute. I have not gone into how do you apply public, how do you do these exams. They're all there, beautifully illustrated, beautiful videos on this website. And I would close my talk with one thing that my mentor taught me. In DDH, if in doubt, 
it's out. If it's out, either do further imaging or if you're doing a closed reduction, go on to do an open reduction. So keep this in mind. If in doubt, it's out. Don't force any treatment. Watch carefully. And I'd like to acknowledge the funding that we received from multiple sources to, for us to be able to carry out this study that we're doing. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Kishore. That was, I think, a very, very comprehensive uh, outlook that you have uh, given us. Uh, I know there'll be a lot of questions from our panelists and from the audience as well. But uh, I think we should first listen to what Woody has to say before we move on to the question answer and the case discussion session. So uh, I turn over the mic to uh, Dr. Woodburg Sankar and Woody, the mic's all yours. Uh, perfect, can everybody hear me? Yes, that's great. Okay, all right, excellent. Well, first, uh, I just wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to uh, speak at this wonderful uh, webinar in front of this uh, great society. So again, it's really a, an absolute honor to be uh, here with the, with the other group presenting and, and have everybody interested in, in what I might have to say. So I'm gonna be talking about the surgical treatment of DDH under three years of age. Uh, as Kishore did, I'm gonna talk about kind of my own approach and then roll in some data where I think it, it makes sense. Um, so in terms of surgical indications, um, this is primarily for high-grade subluxations and dislocations that are not amenable to bracing. And that really means that they fall into one of two groups. Either they've already tried a, a brace or a harness and have failed that, or they present perhaps beyond about six to, month, six to eight months of age, at which time a brace is a little bit less effective. It certainly can be tried, as Kishore showed in those cases, but, but most people think that the efficacy becomes a little bit less and a little bit harder to tolerate for the infants as they get older. Regardless of what type of surgery you choose to do, the goals are always the same, which is to obtain a deep, concentric, and stable reduction, because this uh, optimizes your ability of the acetabulum to remodel and minimizes the risk of complications, most notably a vascular necrosis. So there are two primary options at your disposal. There's closed reduction and spica casting. Then there's open reductions, and these can be performed medial or anterior. And we'll talk about when uh, and if to do a pelvic osteotomy and a femoral osteotomy. So first, let's talk about timing of surgery. Because you mentioned this as well, and you'll see already there's some slight differences. I look at these as really two major scenarios. So the first is kind of the failed brace scenario. So these are the kids that have been in your practice from the beginning. You know about them, uh, and, and they're, you know what they are. You know they need to be treated. And when you choose to treat them, I think depends on several factors. One is your belief in the efficacy of a closed reduction, which we'll talk about how you perceive the risks of anesthesia are to a young infant, uh, and you heard some differences already about that. Um, what you think the relative importance of the ossific nucleus is, uh, which I think more and more is being discounted, uh, but some people still feel strongly about that. And then your comfort on performing open reductions on extremely small infants. My own personal preference, which is different as you already heard than Kishore's, is I, I take these patients to the operating room around seven to eight months of age. At our institution, we believe the anesthetic risk decreases after six months. Uh, and to me, that's the right uh, time in terms of size of child. And I always uh, uh, set patients up to go directly from a closed reduction to an open reduction under the same anesthetic. And then we can get all the casting done before the children start to walk. So that's my preference. Um, the second scenario is the older age situation. And I think there's very little controversy beyond 18 months. I think most people would say, you know, these patients can be scheduled for surgery as soon as is feasible with the family and the surgeon. Um, when you have the younger kids, so below perhaps 10 to 11 months, I, I think of them similar to that failed brace scenario where I, I basically go as soon as they're beyond seven to eight months, uh, as I mentioned. I think where there's some controversy is the in-between age, so 11 to 18 months of age. I think there are kind of two schools of thought. One is to go early in these kids to try to maximize your acetabular remodeling potential. But the other school of thought is maybe you should wait until about 18 months of age uh, when the child perhaps is larger and you can perform a concomitant pelvic osteotomy because there may be a high rate of residual dysplasia if you just do the open reduction. And so I think there's these two kind of competing views that are becoming more prevalent, uh, at least in North America. My own preference is to go early if they're in 12 or 13 months. I find it hard to wait four to six months in a kid uh, uh, to put the hip in at that age. However, the closer they approach 18 months, I'll just go ahead and schedule them and plan on doing a pelvis at that same time. And we'll talk more about that. So let's get back to closed reduction and spiky casting. So what are the indications in my mind? Uh, again, high-grade subluxations, dislocations, intermediate age group, six to 15 months of age. I think this procedure has gotten a lot of criticism recently by many of my own friends in North America. However, I think this uh, procedure still plays a very important role in the DDH armamentarium. 
I think uh, the people that criticize this say that uh, there's high rates of needing to go back later and do something on the pelvis, which we'll talk about more. But I think the key here is getting a high quality reduction. I think if you can get that femoral head nicely and deeply seated in the acetabulum, and you can do that very nicely in a closed technique, I think there are some advantages. I believe, as Dennis Wenger does, uh, that the infant hip is like a Swiss watch. It's this beautiful uh, working device, and if you don't have to open it up and mess with it, there may be some, some upsides to that. Uh, but again, the key is getting a high quality reduction. So in terms of technique, I take these patients to the OR, I assess their initial reducibility with a, you know, an, a typical Orlani maneuver to see if I feel it reduce. Uh, if it does, then I assess the stability uh, through the safe zone by how much abduction, adduction, internal rotation, et cetera, what finds that optimal position and how unstable the hip is. I then assess tension, and this is important because this uh, we think is a major risk factor for osteonecrosis, which has been reported to be anywhere from two to 36% after these procedures. Admittedly, this is very hard to quantify when you're teaching trainees and experience and feel play a major role. This is the art of uh, hip dysplasia treatment. Um, certainly you can uh, manage the tension to some extent by performing a tenotomy, either of the longest or even uh, uh, the psoas. But I don't feel like tenotomies are a panacea. So I don't feel like you can push a hip that's very tight in and then try to do some tenotomies to get you safe. I think of tenotomies as an extra layer of protection for a hip that does gently basically reduce on its own. And this is where preoperative traction uh, could be helpful. I personally do not have any experience with this or very little experience with this in North America, but certainly this is used throughout the world, but some mixed results in the literature. But this is where this may play a role in to try to relax the soft tissues before taking the patient to the operating room. Uh, once, you assume that, or once you assess that the hip does reduce and that the tension's not too bad, I think the most important thing is to assess the quality of the reduction. And this is where I think an arthrogram is absolutely crucial. There are some institutions, some peer institutions around the world that don't do arthrograms. I find this a really essential part of this. I think this is another one of those arts of, uh, of DDH treatment. To, I could look at hundreds of arthrograms and, and pick up something different from each one and, and feel like I learned something. And no two hips are the same. There are some basic things that you want to think through as you go through this. You want to assess the medial dipole, which is essentially an assessment for how uh, medialized the hip is. So ideally, you see a thin rim of dye uh, there showing that the femoral head is having nice contact with the, uh, with the acetabular surface. Ideally, you see a nice chondrolabral complex with a, hopefully a sharp corner, but at least a pretty reasonable corner, uh, and, and most of the femoral head lying underneath this structure. And the real question I ask myself when I uh, assess these arthrograms is, can I make this better with an open reduction? You know, there are a lot of these femoral heads that are aspherical, and so you'll see some differences in the dye. But I try to say, you know, can I make this better by opening the hip? So here's some arthrograms that I was less happy with. So uh, on the first one here is a, a very thick ligamentum teres causing lateralization of the femoral head. In the middle is an example of an infolded labrum that's creating some incongruency. And then uh, the last one is, uh, is a large medial dipole, um, uh, which indicates that that femoral head is not as medialized as I'd like. So all of these, in my mind, would be, uh, would be unacceptable arthrograms. Oops, sorry. Um, so a few more slides about the importance of the quality of reduction. So uh, G in 2016 looked at 41 hips, mean fall up of 18 months. They looked at the uh, quality of the reduction based on post-operative MRI. And they found, not surprisingly, that the better reduced the hip, the better the tonus graded long-term follow-up, the lower the acetabular index, meaning less residual dysplasia, and less severe forms of osteonecrosis at follow-up. In the classic study by Race and Herring, they looked at 59 hips, combination of x-rays and arthrograms, and they said that the most important factor in outcome was the quality of the initial reduction. And they came up with this definition of a poor reduction is greater than a seven millimeter medial dipole, but admittedly, this is actually very hard to apply uh, intraoperatively to fluoroscopy where you can't measure so well. Forland in 1992 looked at 72 hips, mean of follow-up of five years, and they found that the higher medialization ratio on the arthrogram yielded better results in terms of the Severin outcome classification. And if there was an interposed limbus, this led to poor results and increased rates of osteonecrosis. So again, quality of reduction is absolutely key. So again, to drive home this point even more, well-medialized hip, uh, um, chondrolabral complex covers the femoral head pretty well. That hip looks pretty good at several year follow-up. In contrast, infolded labrum, not a great reduction, but this was accepted. And this is a hip that's subluxated and some symphysial changes. So that's what you're trying to avoid. 
So assuming you have a nice reduction, a high quality reduction, the tension's adequate, um, uh, you go ahead and apply a spike of cast. I use a Gore-Tex liner to help with skin care. Uh, I use that arthrogram to help drive uh, the optimal position in the spike of cast. Uh, I use plaster to give us a nice mold. I spent a lot of time getting this upward trochanteric mold to hold the hip in place, and I include both legs in the spica. I think it's important to get some form of advanced imaging to confirm that your hips are in three-dimensionally. There's lots of different options at your disposal. You can do CT scans. You can do intraoperative CT scans, which we call the O-arm. You can use an ultrasound, which is pretty uh, uh, readily available through the window in the cast. My own preference uh, these days is to do a perfusion MRI. Um, I think this offers some very detailed positional information after a closed reduction to look at any residual blocks to, to, to reduction. Helps correlate me with the arthrogram. Uh, I do use contrast, which gives you some perfusion information. I think more and more this is becoming a little bit murky as far as how predictive this data is, but I still do it. I think it gives me some information. I schedule these to be done within six hours uh, um, after the patient uh, has their spike cast placed on. We do this unsedated after the patient's extubated. The patients can't move too much in the spica, so we still can get detailed info. Uh, as I said, the interpretation is a little bit challenging. There's a lot of subjectivity to it. You have to look at a lot of these uh, to get a sense of this, but in general, I remove the cast if the hip is globally blacked out. Uh, and I tend to observe partial decreases in perfusion based on some of the Boston Children's data. So here's what you want to see, which is that uh, left hip reduced uh, and uh, some nice vascular channels. Here's an example of, of a focal decrease in perfusion with that stripe there. Uh, that's something I would observe. And then most concerning would be a complete blackout in the hip. And, and that's a hip that would concern me more and I would take that cast off. Uh, my personal post-op protocol after a closed reduction, assuming that the hip is in and, and I'm happy with the perfusion, I bring the patients back at three weeks for a non-contrast rapid protocol MR that only takes us about five to eight minutes at our institution. We do that unsedated. I offer them a cast change at six weeks, but I, more and more I'm trying to avoid second anesthetics in these infants is for the reasons Kishore mentioned about brain development. And so I go three months before taking it off and then convert to an abduction brace for nights and naps indefinitely, but for at least a year and a half to two years to facilitate remodeling and then regular follow-up with x-rays. Outcomes of closed reductions. So we have pretty reasonable prospective IGI data. We had 87 hips in this series, mean fall, uh, a little less than two years. 91% of hips remain stable. You can see how that relates to others in the literature. A 25% rate of osteonecrosis. We used a pretty rigorous definition with multiple reviewers and consensus rating. So I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty good metric uh, in this particular study. Uh, mean has to have our index 25 degrees and rate of further corrective surgery 11%. And, and we'll talk about this in a second, but this is a, a little bit dicey when you look at this as an outcome measure because it's very subjective. So here are my opinions on closed reductions. As I mentioned, I, I think there's been this growing movement away from this procedure. In my opinion, I think redislocations and avascular necrosis are a clear failure of treatment. Nobody would be happy with that. But in my opinion, residual acetabular dysplasia is not necessarily a failure of closed reduction. I think if you look at the, the reports uh, that uh, condemn closed reductions, they often use further corrective surgery as an outcome marker. And this is really subjective. So it depends on the surgeon decision making to decide whether or not to intervene. And Kishore has showed us in, in uh, one of his IGI studies uh, that this is notoriously unreliable. So in my own opinion, and if this was my family and those are my three kids, um, I would take a high quality closed reduction over the potential risks of opening a hip and creating stiffness and scarring and that Swiss watch analogy that Dennis Wenger talked about. And that's even if I have to come back later, several years down the road and do a subsequent extra articular osteotomy. Again, this is my opinion. So if I never have to open the joint and I have to do an extra articular osteotomy down the road, to me, I think there are some upsides to that. But again, I recognize that that's not everybody's opinion. All right, so when do you go open? Well, the obvious answer is when you can't get a good close reduction. Uh, we have some data showing that open reductions become more likely if you have a graft four hip on that initial ultrasound, if you have an IHDI grade four hip, which is that bottom right, so a higher uh, dislocation, and a negative Orlani sign, meaning that the hip is uh, clinically irreducible uh, in the outpatient setting. The other uh, relative indication for an open reduction is increasing age, so perhaps beyond 18 months, when you start uh, uh, thinking that the, there may be diminished uh, remodeling potential in the pelvis and you're gonna be there doing an open procedure anyway, and you may say, uh, you know, I wanna be absolutely sure the hip is well reduced, and then you can do these medial or anterior. 
So the medial open reduction, there's lots of different techniques that have been uh, described, but uh, the most common used in North America, at least, is the Stu Weinstein modified Ludloff approach done through a medial adductor incision. The interval is between the pectineus and the neurovascular bundle. This creates kind of two windows around the medial femoral circumflex artery. The distal window can be used to access the psoas, which you release off the trochanter. The proximal window is used to access the medial capsule. You open this, you come right down on the, on the TAL and the ligament teres, which you can excise or you can reserve for potentially repairing. I tell my fellows and residents that the medial open reduction is really an augmented closed reduction. You're clearing out the, the impediments, but you're not doing anything to hold it in. So you're still relying on the spica. So that's, uh, that's why I use a similar technique to a closed reduction. So I use a three month uh, spica with the hip and more flexion, just like I would with the closed reduction technique. I still get advanced imaging, but I do it slightly differently after a medial open reduction. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. So I tend to uh, get CT scans more. I, I actually personally use the O-arm, which I can do intraoperatively. I do that because I've opened the hip and I do not want to leave the operating room unless that hip is in. So this allows me immediate decision making. If the hip is out, I can either readjust the spica or reopen the hip. Um, again, MRIs have their uh, upsides. Um, uh, there's no radiation. Uh, it gives you more information about persistent soft tissue blocks. But to me, the perfusion data is, is far less helpful because I've already harmed the hip with an incision and I can't necessarily undo what I've just done just by taking the cast off. So I almost don't wanna know what the perfusion info is at that point. And it also requires me leaving the operating room, which as I said, I prefer not to do after I've done an open surgery. So advantages of medial open reduction, great visualization of the medial side of the joint, especially the TAL. It's minimally invasive. These are extraordinarily cosmetic incisions uh, that almost completely disappear. It spares the ilium and the abductors, which I think is important for these kids who often need surgeries later in life. Disadvantages, you can't do a capsulography, uh, which may be necessary in certain cases. You cannot perform a pelvic osteotomy through the uh, same incision. Uh, and I find this harder to manage soft tissue tension uh, so for me, it's harder to extend that capsulotomy far underneath the neurovascular bundle. So it's hard for me to go get a very high hip. Uh, and so I get a little bit nervous about uh, managing tension in that situation through this approach. In terms of outcomes, Gardner wrote a nice systematic review in 2014 uh, out of um, uh, sick kids, 734 hips, mean fall of 10.9 years. The AVN rates you see there that increase with age. Uh, low redislocation rates, and again, further corrective surgery is 26%, but as I mentioned to you already, that's a fairly unreliable metric. So my personal indications for a medial open reduction are younger infants or below perhaps 12 months of age. I'd like to do them when I try a closed reduction and I feel the head engage with the acetabulum. So that tells me that the tension is not too excessive and I'm going to be able to bring that hip down but I'm left with a primarily medial obstruction, like this, uh, this arthrogram, which I already showed you, that thick ligament teres. I tend to avoid medial open reductions in syndromic kids with really uh, laxity conditions. In those kids, I like having all my tools in the toolbox, so I like being able to do a capsulography and potentially add a pelvis if necessary. And then I use a similar post-op protocol as my closed reductions. So again, a three-week follow-up MRI just to make sure the hip is in the joint, uh, three months in the cast, and then braces for nights and naps. All right, anterior open reduction. So these are done through a bikini incision, a Smith-Peterson approach, uh, would detach the rectus, uh, split the apophysis, elevate the outer table down through a pseudoacetabulum if that's present. Uh, the psoas gets lengthened at the pelvic brim, uh, and then you work underneath this to expose your capsule widely and medially, and then perform your arthrotomy. Once the joint is open, you got to release those classic impediments to re reduction. So the ligamentum teres gets excised, the pulvinar gets excised, TAL gets released. Um, then I place my capsular sutures once I like my reduction that I check on fluoro. Um, I use non-absorbable sutures medially. I use one, I'm sorry, I use absorbable sutures medially. I use one non-absorbable suture laterally so that if I have to come back in a revision case, I can find my plane. Um, I then place a spike of cast in a little bit of a different position than the, the, the uh, closed reduction, so more extended, 30 degrees of uh, of flexion, 30 degrees of abduction, and 20 degrees of internal rotation on average. These are one and a half leg cast, um, um, sparing the contralateral uh, uh, side below the knee. Um, I use a similar post-op imaging protocol as my medial open reductions, meaning that I prefer intraoperative CTs so that I know before I leave the OR that the hip is in uh, over MRIs in general. But my follow-up protocol is different. So I still get the MRI three weeks. Again, that five, 10 minute uh, rapid study with no contrast, uh, non-sedated. 
Um, I removed the spike at six weeks as opposed to three months because I think stiffness is more of an issue and I performed a capsulography. I switched to an Ilfeld brace at two weeks full time. Why do I use this brace? Kishore mentioned a little bit in the non-operative treatment. I like this brace because I think stiffness is often um, uh, kind of undersold after these procedures. And I, like, I don't like the patients to be as widely abducted as they end up being in a, in a rhino cruise. User. So I like dialing in less abduction to make it a, a transition from full immobilization to complete mobility. Um, so I do that and then regular follow-ups at three, six, 12 months and then yearly. So advantages of the anterior open reduction, I think it's very utilitarian, it's extensile. It allows you to perform very wide releases. I think uh, if you do extremely long capsulotomies, you can often uh, hold off on or avoid doing femoral osteotomies in, in many cases. Uh, but I think it's the best way to manage tension. You can form the capsulorophy, you can form the pelvic osteotomy through the same incision. Disadvantages of the anterior approach, I think, are the effect on the iliac apophysis and the abductors, which could be an issue for kids that sometimes, unfortunately, get set up for several surgical procedures. And I think it's slightly less cosmetic. Outcomes, there's lots of studies on anterior open reduction. This is a bit of unpublished data from the IHDR and IGI, 69 hips. Uh, you can see there were no full redislocations, a 12% subluxation rate and a pretty similar AVN rate using the same methodology uh, as we did for the closed reduction cohort. So my indications for anterior open reductions is everybody else that didn't get a medial. So that means anybody over the age of about 12 months, high dislocations, kids with syndromic uh, conditions or laxity conditions, and anyone who I feel needs a concomitant pelvis at the time of surgery. Speaking of which, so let's talk about that. So, when do you perform a concomitant pelvic osteotomy? So if you look at the long-term data, you know, we worry about avascular necrosis and we worry about um, uh, redislocation for good reason, but it's really residual dysplasia that's the silent killer of these hips. And that's the best predictor really of long-term survivorship. And SW remodeling is highly unpredictable. Some hips will remodel very quickly and very nicely, and some hips will kind of plateau and not get much better. It's very hard to know uh, when you first put the hip in which one you're gonna get. So how should you decide on when to add this additional procedure, which is an additional procedure. It adds or operating room time, it adds some blood loss, it adds some, some, uh, a little bit of pain for the, for the children. So I think there's three factors to think about. So one is intraoperative stability. So if you're struggling to get stability of the hip, that may be a reason to add a pelvic osteotomy. With increasing age or increasing severity of initial dysplasia, those may be other factors to think about. And I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the data for that right now. So let's talk about what we know about acetabular remodeling. So a lot of this comes from obviously the pioneering work of, uh, of Salter. Uh, and he taught us that acetabular remodeling really decreases after about 18 months. And so he advocated routine osteotomy uh, for children getting an open reduction after this age. And that's really uh, where this 18 month number really comes from that people uh, has become really dogma. Um, Lee in 2015 looked at 74 hips min, uh, after closed reductions, minimum fall of four years and used some statistical analysis and found, not surprisingly, that the younger age at reduction and a lower initial acetabular index correlated with lower rates of residual dysplasia. I think the best acetabular remodeling study out there, which I would highly encourage everyone to read, comes from Stu Weinstein's group, published in 2004. They looked at 72 hips, 43 of whom had long-term follow-up, so mean of 40 years, so great follow-up as all of the stuff from Iowa does and has really made huge contributions to our field. Um, mean age of surgery, pretty representative, at least of the kids we see in North America, uh, and maybe not as much as uh, the older walking kids that you may see in India. I think what really is important about this study is that there were no acetabular ephemeral procedures. So this was a clean cohort of no additional things done. So all this looked at was the effect of reducing the hip. Now it was both closed and open reductions, but, um, but there were no additional procedures, which I think is very nice from a scientific standpoint. And there are two, there's lots of outcomes from this data, but I'm gonna highlight two of them. One of them is that patients who had seven, three or four outcomes, which are pretty poor outcomes, were significantly older at the time of initial reduction. So that tells us that the younger you get to the hip, the better. The second take home point that's pertinent to this specific discussion is that the residual dysplasia that was present after reduction was the strongest predictor of a poor result. Okay, so residual dysplasia is the killer of your long-term outcomes. So when are you gonna do a pelvic osteotomy to try to address or mitigate this residual dysplasia? So as you guys, everyone knows who are sophisticated on this call, there are um, um, 
there are multiple procedures. There's reshaping procedures as a category for pelvic osteotomies. There are redirectional procedures, which reorient the face of the acetabular mouth. And then there are salvage procedures that uh, uh, build kind of non-anatomic uh, or non-physiologic bone over the top of the femoral head to get coverage. And I'm not going to talk about this latter group. So briefly about reshaping osteotomies. Uh, these are your Pembertons, your Degas, your San Diegos. These involve incomplete cuts in the pelvis where you get plastic deformation through bending and hinging through the triradiate or the sciatic notch or the medial cortex. I think there's a lot, you know, institution get very hung up on the details between these uh, osteotomies or acetabular plasties. I tell people all the time, you know, the distance between the Dega and the Pemberton on this figure, and this is one of the nicest figures I've seen about this from Paul Sponseller's chapter, the distance between those is in a two-year-old pelvis is about a centimeter. I just don't think that there's huge differences. I think these procedures are much more similar than they are different, and so I consider them collectively. These are stable procedures because the SM wants to close on itself, uh, so you generally do not need fixation. And the biggest knock on these procedures is that you may be decreasing the volume of the acetabulum, which can be an issue if you have an enlarged uh, femoral head. So here's some uh, kind of a, an illustration of this. It's a little bit exaggerated, but I think it's helpful, especially for some people out there who may have less familiarity with these procedures. The gold is the triradiate cartilage. The red is the direction of the cut. Bone graft is not typically taken here. It is in this illustration for reasons I don't entirely understand. But the bone gets uh, wedged in and plastically deformed down. And this is, again, a pemberton Dega variant. And that's the correction that, uh, that occurs. The Salter osteotomy is a redirectional procedure. So again, we're reorienting the face of the acetabular mouth. Uh, it's a single cut from the sciatic notch to a point just inferior to the ASIS. You're relying on symphyseal mobility to get rotation through the pubic symphysis. Uh, you put a wedge uh, uh, in place, um, uh, but you need internal fixation to hold it. Because of the symphyseal mobility, it really is best for younger patients. And there's been some nice modeling studies by George Rabb showing uh, slightly more anterior than lateral coverage. And there's always a theoretical question of whether this can actually be done bilaterally since you're rotating through the pubic symphysis. Uh, I think most people believe it can uh, um, once you've fixed one side. So this is what this looks like. Again, this is a little bit of an exaggerated illustration, but you can see the correction that gets uh, obtained. The graft uh, typically gets taken from the top of the ilium. Uh, it's not my preference, but that's the classic description. Again, slightly more anterior than lateral coverage. So what about comparing these two? Um, there's several studies out there. Dan Cicado uh, presented this in POSNA in 2014. I don't think it was published, um, but he had 10-year follow-up data, uh, 19 Pembertons versus 55 Salters, uh, and found a, a really good follow-up, no significant difference in the rates of residual dysplasia. Turkish study from 2013 comparing uh, 50 Pembertons to 47 Salters, mean follow-up over five years. s to depth ratio is slightly better in the Pembertons, but other than that, s to index, center edge angle, Reimer's migration index, really no significant differences. So in my opinion, this is really dealer's choice. People will argue back and forth, but I think at the end of the day, it, 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 I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. Now, my own indications for doing the pelvis, I do them routinely after 18 months of age, uh, following the Salterian uh, school of thought. I do it selectively in patients between 14 and 18 months of age based on the size of a child or the severity of the initial dysplasia. So if I have a bigger kid uh, you know, who has higher degrees of dysplasia, I'll do it. There's nothing magic about 18 months. If I have a very, very small ex preemie, uh, I may be more likely to hold off. Um, now, which uh, pelvis do I do? Uh, to me, it depends on the type of dislocation. I use the Dagerton, Degas or the Pemberton type acetabuloplasties for the so-called slide dislocations. These are just, this is a term I picked up from Martin Gargan. These are dislocations where the hip has probably been coming in and out uh, throughout infancy and the acetabulum opens up and becomes quite capacious. So for these, I like the idea of decreasing the volume and bending down the lip of the acetabulum, as you can see here. Um, in contrast, uh, there's Martin described what's so-called the jump dislocation, where the hip has completely escaped the acetabulum. It really hasn't uh, hung up on the corner, and so you don't get this opening up. Often in these cases, you actually have a relatively short sore seal, and for this, I think it's harder to bend this down because it may not be over uh, the center point of the femoral head. So in these, I like to reorient the acetabulum around the femoral head, uh, and so I prefer a Salter osteotomy in these kids. And then beyond five or six age, years of age, I prefer doing triples. All right, let's talk about femoral osteotomy. So when should you form a concomitant femoral osteotomy? Well, I think there's two primary indications. The first is for shortening, and this is to alleviate tension. 
and try to mitigate the risk of osteonecrosis as well as stiffness. In North America, this has largely replaced traction, uh, which uh, seeks to accomplish the same goals. The other indication is derotation. And this will be if you have typically excessive femoral antiversion that you're worried about, uh, and uh, you're trying to create a more optimal uh, uh, environment for mobilization and uh, improve stability of the hip, you may want to derotate the hip. So the classic article on femoral shortening comes from Perry Scheniker. Uh, is an older study that compared a group of traction kids to kids that had femoral shortening osteotomy. These were slightly older than the group we're supposed to talk about in this, in this uh, webinar. Uh, mean fall was 11 years for the traction group, four years for the osteotomy group. They had a, a pretty, you know, a pretty reasonable stiffness score that they came up with, and they showed pretty clearly more stiffness in the traction group postoperatively, and a significantly higher osteonecrosis rate compared to the osteotomy group. And this uh, study it really has changed uh, the standard of care, at least in North America, uh, with osteotomy being preferred over traction. Um, what about predictors for when you might need to shorten in terms of counseling families? Well, we did a study with Colin Mosley uh, back in 2009, 72 hips. We had a 35% rate of femoral shortening. Uh, risk factors for femoral shortening were age over three years and increased vertical displacement. And then Alisaf uh, published a study not too long ago at looking at a very large series. 22% rate of femoral shortening with risk factors being IGI grade four, male gender, and older age. What about derotation? So again, when, we were, when I was working with Colin, uh, we looked at this. If you look at that uh, bar graph on your right, you'll see uh, we assessed the number of patients going to open reduction for hip dysplasia and saw there was a wide variation in baseline antiversion. So we had patients that were 70 to 80 degrees antivert. We had patients that were less than 10 degrees antivert. And it wasn't really correlated with age. So given this baseline variability, it's not surprising that the indications for when to derotate are actually fairly controversial. If you look at the classic pediatric orthopedic tests, at least in the English literature, um, uh, you got Lovell and Winter and the Texas Scottish Rite uh, uh, text, and they've quoted that antiversion in DDH is not common and that they don't recommend derotation. Um, uh, Wanger uh, in 1995 on this topic published a study saying he usually uh, derotates 30 degrees. In terms of surgical technique, uh, I like to assess version uh, before I make incision. I do this the way Colin Mosley taught me. I flex the knee over the end of the bed. I externally rotate the limb until the ossific nucleus lines up with the femoral shaft. And then I subtract the amount of external rotation from 90 to get a, an estimate of the version. Now you can internally rotate till you see the broadest neck, but in a, a kind of moderately ossified infant, uh, it is sometimes hard to figure out what's the broadest neck. So that's the approach I use. So lateral approach to the femur through a separate incision, subvastus. I use a one-third tubular plate that's cut from five holes down to four. I apply to the lateral aspect of the, of the proximal screw in and then loosen it and rotate the plate out of the way. I make a derotation mark. You can see with that uh, colored uh, um, um, marking pen and the red arrow. Uh, I then form a subtrochanteric osteotomy to decide how much to shorten you could use the overlap technique, which is when you reduce the hip and see how much of the, of the uh, femur overlaps and cut that. In my mind, it's usually about 12 to 15 millimeters and I often just cut it to that amount. My own indications for doing the femur, again, as I said, I assess version pre-incision in every patient. I then shorten based on how tight it is. I've had four-year-olds that I don't shorten and I've had 18-month-old kids that I do shorten. I think, again, that's another of the art of, uh, of uh, hip dysplasia treatment. In general, it's about 12 to 15 millimeters for me. Uh, and then I tend to derotate if I think the antiversion exceeds 50 degrees. Uh, I try to get them to about 30. I try to avoid overcorrection as you can create posterior instability. All right, just a couple slides on revision surgery. So this is obviously best to avoid. Um, uh, every study that's ever been done shows that these uh, are gonna do the worst. They have the highest rates of osteonecrosis, the poorest outcomes in terms of stiffness, residual severing grade, and dysplasia. So we looked at this uh, again with Colin uh, uh, in 2011. We matched 22 successful open reductions with 22 failures. Importantly, all of the index and revision surgeries were done at the same institution, meaning that this was a pretty reasonable surgical technique. There's a lot of papers that talk about failed open reductions coming from elsewhere, and it's really hard to know what was done at that initial surgery. But this was a pretty clean cohort in this regard. Uh, risk factors for redislocation were right-sided involvement or bilateral involvement and less abduction in the spica. And then intraoperative reasons for failure were a large dysmorphic femoral head, 
an abnormal femoral version. Other studies that have been done on this topic have suggested that inadequate uh, release of the inferior capsule and the transverse acetabular ligament can also be risk factors. Performance surgery, I think you got to take a very careful history, especially if the family does not know very much what happened uh, or, or if the operation was not done at your institution. So you have to try to figure out what was done. You have to do a little detective work and look around at the scars and try to uh, guess from the x-rays maybe what happened. I think you should think about genetic testing uh, to see if there's an underlying laxity uh, situation or a syndrome that may have led to the, uh, to the failure. Assess range of motion, figure out how stiff the hip is and neurovascular function. You want to know what you're walking into. I have a pretty low threshold for getting advanced imaging. I like to, to assess femoral version uh, a little bit more uh, quantitatively uh, than uh, the, the exam that I mentioned uh, at the time of surgery. And then also get a sense of the acetabular morphology. So if you look at that top MRI, this is a failure uh, in a patient who has essentially no posterior wall. And so it's not surprising in retrospect that that hip didn't do so well. In terms of timing of revision surgery, I try to avoid the hyperemic stage. So if it's my own redislocation, I will try a, you know, a close reduction right away if I can identify it. But if it comes to me later, I'll let the hip cool off um, and, and have it not be so hyperemic. And I, if the kid's younger, I like to wait until they're a little bit older so that I can perform uh, pelvic procedures to help to augment my success rate. At the time of surgery, this is, this is hard stuff. I think you have to have a meticulous technique and do this very carefully. Uh, in my hands, this always is done through an anterior approach. Um, so again, I have all the tools in my toolbox. You have to be careful with the femoral nerve because the psoas has been lengthened and often there will not be much muscular protection uh, for that structure. Um, very methodical as you go through um, your blocks to uh, uh, reduction. A lot of attention to the inferior capsule and the TAL. Go through the bony contributions and figure out what you can make better. And these are cases in my hands that I consider doing a transarticular pin. This has been published by uh, Pablo Katsaneda. Uh, and I think this is a nice technique. This is a, a case of mine I'm showing in that fluoro image. Uh, and I think it can be helpful. And then I, I, uh, I often consider it spending a, a longer than six weeks in the spica cast. All right, so this is in conclusion. Uh, closed reductions and open reductions uh, are both effective in my opinion, although closed reductions, as I said, have been getting a little bit of a bad reputation recently. Um, I think that in general, earlier reduction is better, so it, I don't wait too often. Um, pelvic osteotomies uh, are very important for older patients who have more significant initial dysplasia because as I tell, told you, residual dysplasia is really the biggest issue down the road in terms of survivorship. Femoral osteotomies are, should be performed when needed for shortening or derotation. And revision surgery is never ideal. Always try to get it right the first time. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Woodbub. I think you've really covered that uh, topic very, very comprehensively. Uh, I know that was a, a, a lot of stuff to cover, going right from the need for open reduction, the role of femoral osteotomies and pelvic osteotomies. Uh, I think we'll give you a little break here. You need maybe to drink a little water. <laughs> In the meantime, we'll get back to Kishore and uh, maybe ask him a few questions. Uh, we seem to be having some issues with the uh, uh, Zoom recording because I think a few people have been mentioning that they were getting dogged out repeatedly. So I'll just check with uh, Sandeep and uh, Neeraj. Neeraj, are we back on again or is there a problem still? Neeraj is muted. Yeah, so I don't know who else is there. Is uh, Niren, Sandeep. Oh, I'm here, Alaric. Alaric. Yes. Alaric. Yes, yeah, sir. already the recording is going on. So don't worry, we will be able to transmit it later on also. So please continue the webinar. All right. Okay. We will be, yeah. So I think uh, Kishore and uh, Bodhva, there's been some technical issues and a couple of minutes we have, I think we have logged out uh, from the main group. But as Diren says, we are recording all of this and it will be up on the website so we can still continue with the, with the discussion and with the cases. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes to go. So uh, if there are any questions that uh, the other panelists have, or we can go on to the cases directly. Yes, Ramni. Yeah, uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentations, both uh, uh, Kishore and Shankar. So let me, I have a few questions, Alaric, if you permit, permit me. Yeah, so sure. uh, Kishore, uh, you know, in the course of your 
presentation, I had this impression that in irreducible hips, if once you have uh, started off on a pavlic harness, then um, you switch over to rigid bases and do not uh, consider close reduction at some point of time. So my question to you is that what is your threshold to switch over to close reduction? Yeah, so I, I, I said, Ramani, for me personally, that approach of switching to a more rigid brace has not worked. And the case that I showed is one of my colleagues. Okay. So I, I start with a public harness. And if that's not successful, I have tried. And sometimes I still do. I tell the family, look, I, I don't know if this will work. I'm happy to try. And I leave it to the families to decide which way they would go. But the few the families have said, yeah, they would try more rigid brace because as we've seen in my presentation, there are people that do switch over or actually start with the rigid brace and claim that they have a better success rate. So I switch over to a close reduction as early as two months if the families agree knowing the anesthesia risk. But the majority do. Um, and so I do somewhere wherever I can actually have access to them. But the ones that don't, and I do them at four months of age, any time after four, four to six months, whenever I can get the family to come in to have that. Because if the clothes doesn't work, then I can, the anatomy is hopefully big enough for me, at least that I can appreciate that I can go on to an open reduction. Okay, two more questions to you. One is, what are your views on that gradual reduction by public harness beyond you know, in the early infancy, that is one. And what is your, uh, the, the threshold for switching over from close to open? What is yeah. the general age when you switch over to from close to open? So I would always, you know, I look, I, when I trained with uh, people like you, and you honestly, you have way more experience than I do in this, and you do a lot more numbers than we do. So when I worked with, uh, you know, Dr. Benjamin Joseph, my experience and which I carried on to early part of my practice, which I would do close reductions up to two, two and a half years of age. And that's it. I would do nothing else at that point in time if they work. So I would always try close reduction, but I must say that age has come down. And when I started appreciating, if in doubt it's out, in other ways, I have actually probably forced a lot of close reductions, which I don't do now. If in doubt it's out, if it's out, do an open reduction. And for me, I have a low threshold for doing an open reduction because I think a forceful close reduction, even though I love the Swiss watch analogy, and that's, that's the beauty of our registry is that we have so many different ways that we all go with. And um, I do an open reduction. So I have a very low threshold because when you look at, again, preliminary results, the ABN rate actually in our close reduction group is slightly more than our open reduction group. So they're not significantly more. But what we don't know is uh, what Woody is alluding to. What does that mean 10, 20, 30 years from now? Are we going to see more growth disturbances because of open reduction? We don't know that. But I have a low threshold. So I'd say roughly 12 months and up, I am really looking at, you know, in fact, if I see someone at 12, I almost now wait till 18 months and I do everything at once. Close reduction open and possibly a public cost yard. Well, I don't do close reductions. I, I'm actually doing more of open reductions beyond 10 months of age because I actually believe what you just said that beyond 10, 10 months, okay, let us keep it as one year. Once you start believing that you are actually achieving close reductions beyond one year of age, you are subconsciously actually forcing that hip inside. So I switch over this question to Shankar. Your, your, uh, your presentation was extensive, pretty extensive and very, very well covered. My question to you is, when, what is your threshold to switch over to open reduction? I mean, that is, that is the question right now. Yeah, so thank you. I, I think it's a great question, and I think that's the art, and that's what makes this you know, such an interesting disease process to treat. Uh, and, and I believe, as I, as I do, strongly in closed reduction, but you, know, you don't see the denominator, right? You don't see the patients that I opened. Uh, and I do far more, by numbers, I do far more open reductions than I do closed reductions. Um, so I would say, you know, just 
roughly off the top of my head, I'd say, I would say probably if I go to the OR, probably two thirds of my patients in this uh, seven to 14 month age group, probably two thirds get opened and maybe one third are closed. But, you know, really it's, I really care about the arthrogram. So I know a lot of centers don't use arthrograms. To me, I, it's like flying blind. I don't know how I could make an interpretation based on a radiograph. Uh, I'm fascinated with arthrograms. I find them so interesting and, and I, I kind of scrutinize all the detail and my fellows will spend 10 minutes looking at the arthrogram, you know, intraoperatively. Um, but to me, I ask myself the question, if I, and the Colin Mosley trained me uh, among other people and, and, you know, he was not a big closed reduction or a medial open reduction person. He didn't do a lot of arthrograms and he would always ask, you know, are you going to make this hip better? You know, and if you're not going to make the hip better, by opening the hip, then don't necessarily open the hip. So to me, I look at, you know, is it, is that, it, it, you know, am I, what am I getting out of the way? Is that meal, is that feral head as medialized as it possibly can be? Or is there something obstructing it? Not inferiorly, but if the most medial aspect of the head at the superior medial aspect of the acetabulum is in contact, I can't get that hip anymore in. So assuming I'm not pushing hard and I'm not, you know, I don't feel tension. I, if I don't feel tension, and I feel like that hip is as in as it's going to be. To me, my kid, I wouldn't want to make an incision and inflict harm just based on a number being an age. Great. Thank, Thank you. Woody. Uh, I have a question now for both Kishore and uh, Woody. Uh, I think Kishore alluded to this in his talk, that there is a school of thought um, which talks of waiting for the osseic nucleus to appear before you do a close or an open reduction. And I think Nick Clark feels very strongly about that. Uh, about the protective uh, influence of the so-called ossific nucleus. So in your practice, what's, what's your thought on this? And, and why has this uh, thing even come about? Why, why do people even think that way? So, you know, I would say this is, this is the power of numbers. And this is the power of a strong, very thoughtful people like um, Dr. Clark or Mr. Clark, whoever we want to call. Nick is an amazing guy who contributed a lot to understanding of DDH, so I don't want to take away from his contributions. But if you look at his original study that's published, he had roughly 20 hips that had auspic nucleus that's present, 20 hips in the other group that did not have an auspic nucleus. Where the auspic nucleus was absent, there was four AVNs. In the other group, there were two AVNs. And so the conclusion is they raised the double the rate of 50% increase in AVN rate in one group. And we all know when you have such small numbers, it could be from chance alone. So when Woody looked at it as a part of his uh, closed reduction paper for IHDI, that did not hold good. In fact, as you could intuitively think about it, the older the child, the more the risk of a AVN, and that's what we found. So in fact, auspic nucleus being present wasn't protective. And if you waited for the auspic nucleus to appear, there may be a trend, mind you, these are small numbers, Emily Schaefer now, a research director, is really looking at predictors of AVN. And I would be hard to think if auspic nucleus would be a predictor that will stand the test of time. So personally for me, I do not wait. And I would recommend people not to wait because we know the natural history is the earlier you get the hip in, the better chance of remodeling and the better chance of doing a gentle reduction versus forcing a reduction if you wait too long. But I'd be interested in Woody's comments. Well, just for the purposes of time, I, I'll, I'll leave. I agree completely. I won't. I won't say much more than that. I thought you were, Eric. I thought you were going to ask me about the um, about the waiting till eighteen months for the pelvic osteotomy because I think that's a, a very hot topic. I think in our in our world right now. Um, I thought you were, that was going to be your question about about timing, which I could answer since I asked the question myself. But uh, if you have another question, I'll let you go. Yeah. Why don't you answer that? Yeah, so, you know, I think a lot of people are saying this in case you were mentioned it himself, and I mentioned a little bit in my talk. I think one of the things that I, I think is, um, is being overlooked in that argument is that we are measuring residual dysplasia on two-dimensional x-rays. And so we're doing a Salter or a Pemberton or whatever you like to do and bending it down or cutting it and rooking it over and making a two-dimensional metric of the Astadler index better and then telling ourselves you know, wow, I really did great to halt residual dysplasia in this patient. And this completely disregards three-dimensional uh, remodeling, right? Version and all these other aspects that I think are, are, are so important. 
And my opinion is you should really get to the hip early rather than waiting for it because all those three-dimensional axial remodeling things that we're not quantifying very well can only be better by getting the hip in early, right? Because that's normal neonatal and infantile development. So to me, the fallacy of, of kind of the delay in six months, for example, some people will wait six, seven months before they put a hip in because they're waiting for this magical 18 month number to do a pelvic osteotomy. First off, if there's nothing magical about 18 months, it comes from Salter. And, and you know, anybody who's done extrophy work, you can do a pelvic osteotomy on a six day old if you need to. I mean, it, can, it certainly can be done. Um, so I don't think there's anything magical about 18 months, but even more so, I would say, I wouldn't wait on the hip because there are, there are three dimensional remodeling effects that we are just, we are just blind to that can only be better by getting the hip in early. So I don't wait, even if I even have to come back and do a pelvic osteotomy, I still feel like, I guess it's a little bit like my idea about close reduction. I don't feel like that's a failure because I feel like there's, it still was better for the joint. Maybe it's a second anesthetic, fine. Maybe it's a second casting, fair enough, but I still think it's better for the joint. we take a question from Vijay. Yeah, I have a question for Vibhav. This is on your arthrogram. Yeah. You have a seven month old child, you've taken to the OR and you've reduced the hip closed. It's stable, you do the arthrogram. And then you see a not so perfect arthrogram, like an increase in the medial pool or an inverted labrum. At, a, at seven months of age, would you accept that or would you do an open reduction? No, I open the hip. You open the hip every time, the even, though it's, even though it's stable and it's not going out. So this is the art, right? So to me, an infolded labrum, I, I'm not a fan of that. There are some, some studies that show that some of that will, including some studies that we've done, showing that it'll dock a little bit and the, and the, and the labrum will evert. I just don't like rolling the dice on that. Um, I think if there's a little bit of a medial dipole, but no thick ligamentum teres, it's a few millimeters, but it's nicely concentric superiorly, you know, that's the judgment call. But I, I am not, this is why I, I think it's a little bit skewed when, when I believe strongly in closed reductions, but I believe strongly in good closed reductions. And so if it's not a, a nice reduction, then I will open that hip. Great. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. I, I'm quite sensitive to the time here that we have already finished an hour and a half. And I don't see we have much time for the cases. But maybe if there's a couple of questions that we could take, that would be great. Uh, Ramni? Yeah. Shankar, a uh, couple of questions pertaining to one is perfusion MRI. I, I, I see that you prefer perfusion MRIs. Is that that because uh, you are concerned about the AVN, is that the reason or uh, that is one? And secondly, I want to know your threshold for performing femoral osteotomies below the age of three years, uh, apart from uh, the, the pelvic osteotomies, which probably is the first preference yeah. as a supplementary procedure. Yeah, so, um, okay, uh, these are all great questions. So perfusion MRI is a, is a long topic. It's a little, um, you know, in general, uh, yes, the indication for the perfusion is, is theoretically to get some insight on the risk of osteonecrosis. And there's a study published from Boston where I trained that kind of started this whole idea. Um, the problem is that there's a moderate correlation. So it's not a great correlation. And the other problem is that it's very subjective. So it's not like you get an answer. You see a decrease and then how much is too much and, and how and remember it's a snapshot in time what's the child's blood pressure at the time that they get the, the perfusion scan so there's so many factors that make it slightly variable that being said in general i think the idea if we're going to get to no avascular necrosis we have to start monitoring flow and i'm working on some contrast and yeah, it's ultrasound stuff but the perfusion mri is part of that package to really look at this again lots of flaws associated with it but that is the idea. So is to get start working towards the answer to get rid of this 25% rate of osteonecrosis. We published a study at CORE showing that with this protocol, where we took the uh, cast off if the hip was blacked out, we dropped our osteonecrosis rate to 4%. And we were pretty rigorous about the definition too. So I do think there is some help. The problem is that you know, it is just, it's hard. Radiologists say, oh, I'm not sure. And unless you're looking at a lot of MRIs and have something to fall back on, it can be very misleading. So I, I tell my fellows that I probably wouldn't do it in practice because it can obviously create more confusion sometimes. And you have to be willing to live in the, in the gray world of the information that you get given. Now, your second question about femoral osteotomies, um, 
I never use femoral osteotomies. Like I never perform varus as part of my osteotomy. Um, I, I think, you know, I try to avoid varus in general um, in all hip operations I do. Uh, you know, maybe Perthes is a slight exception, but in general, I try to avoid it. There's some interesting um, acute phase reactant data from Jonathan Scheneker showing that the physiologic effect of a femoral osteotomy is much more than a pelvic osteotomy as far as the hit on the body. Um, and I think you guys, I'm sure everybody who's on this call has a lot of experience. Like you do femoral osteotomies and you see the kids recover slower from that than they do from the pelvis. And I think that's my feeling as well. So in general, I only do it for shortening if it's tight and that's just a feel, right? And that's just, that depends on how wide of a release you make, what your technique is, but obviously if it's tight, uh, and again, there's, that's such a hard thing to quantify, but, but, um, but yeah, I do it's tight. And then if it's excessively inverted. So if I really need to internally rotate the leg 70 degrees to get that neck to point directly at the acetabulum, you know, I'm going to dial back a little bit of that rotation. So what's the Wait, youngest you so patient much, you have uh, done? Uh, the youngest femoral osteotomy I've done? Yeah. Probably 18 months. I don't think I've done much money under that. I mean, you know, as there's good data about the remodeling of aniversion. And so if you can get, you know, I don't chase excessive aniversion in a 12 month old, but um, yeah, I mean, 18 months, two years. Yeah. I mean, I start doing it if it needs it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Woody and Kishore. I really must say that that was an excellent uh, presentation and discussion uh, from you and from all the panelists. And uh, with the permission of uh, our president, uh, Dhiren, I think we can close the session right now. Yes. And if there's any uh, closing remarks no, you'd like to make, I Dhiren? would just like to thank Kishore and Woody for that. And I would uh, say namaste. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. It's really wonderful. I'm sorry we uh, took too long for the no cases. I apologize. No, no problem. Maybe we can do part two again because there's so much of stuff remaining. Uh, maybe we could just uh, do case discussions and follow up to this webinar. You know, I, yes, I, I would love that where we, why don't we all submit two cases and just discuss around the cases would be, would be fantastic. With, so we have right. a good collection already because everyone has sent in a couple of cases. We have about uh, seven or eight good cases. Maybe the next time right. we could fix yes. up at your convenience and do just case discussions to follow up on what we've discussed today. Alaric, yeah. uh, I think we ought to do the cases. It's very important. Sure, sure. Great. So thank you guys again for joining in and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.